Namaskar students. Today we will be moving to the lecture 20. We are finished with the realist school. We will be moving to the second most important traditional debate and that is utopian liberalism and the st early study of international relations. This is the other theory which is important in international relations and uh, we will look into who are the major thinkers and those who have influenced international relations. So utopian liberalism is early liberalism and you had Jeremy Bentham, James Mill, John Stuart Mill, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, Woodrow Wilson and Norman Agnew. So we'll have a look of what are the major ideas and how did they influence the study of international relations. We will first start with the evolution of what we call utilitarianism. All of you who have written, read uh, political theory, Western political thought, know Jeremy Ben. He was an English philosopher, jurist, and a founder of modern utilitarianism. He uh, is a British philosopher and he lived between 1748 to 1832. Now what is Jeremy Bentham's thought that is extremely relevant for us for today's international relations? As most of you know, Bentham defined a fundamental axiom of his philosophy, the principle that it is the happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. He became a leading theorist of Anglo-American philosophy of law and politics whose ideas greatly influenced the development of welfareism. He advocated individual and economic freedoms, the separation of church and state, freedom of expression, equal rights for women, the right to divorce, and an unpublished, in an unpublished essay, the decriminalizing of homosexual acts, which is very, very advanced. He called for the abolition of slavery, capital punishment and physical punishment, including that of children. He has also become known as an early advocate of animal rights, though strongly in favor of the extension of individual legal rights, he opposed the idea of natural law and natural rights, both of which are considered divine and God-given in origin, calling them nonsense upon stilts. So he did not accept, rather trashed, the divine right theory. Bentham was also a strong, sharp critic of legal fictions. Now what is his principle of utility? Bentham students, uh, if you see to a very, uh, included his secretary and collaborator James Mill, and then the, the latter's son Stuart Mill, the legal philosopher John Austin, as well as Robert Owen, one of the fun, fun founders of utopian socialism. He had considerable influence on the reform of prisons, schools, poor laws, law courts, and parliament itself. Bentham's book, Principles of Morals and Legislation, focuses on the principle of utility and how this view of morality ties into legal uh, legislative practices. His principle of utility regards good as that which produces the greatest amount of pleasure and the minimum amount of pain, and evil as which produces the most pain without the pleasure. This concept of pleasure and pain is defined by Bentham as physical as well as spiritual. Bentham writes about this principle as it manifests itself within the legislation of a society. In order to measure the extent of pain or pleasure that a certain decision will create, he lays down a set of criteria divided into the categories of intensity, duration, certainty, proximity, productiveness, purity, and extent. Using these measurements, he tries to understand whether they create more pleasure or more pain for a society. 
James Mill, James Mill is the father of John Stuart Mill, 1773 to 1836. He's a Scottish historian, economist, political theorist, theorist and philosopher. He is counted among the founders of the Ricardian School of Economics, that is David Ricardo. He also wrote the monumental work, The History of British India. He was the first writer to divide Indian history into three parts, Hindu, Muslim and British, a classification which has proved surpassingly influential in the field of Indian historical studies, but which in recent decades has been deeply problematic. Mill was the father of John Stuart Mill, a noted philosopher of liberalism and utilitarianism, and a colonial administrator at the East India Company. John Stuart Mill, most of you have read his works, 1806 to 73, was the most influential English language philosopher of the 19th century. His most important work is on liberty, he was a naturalist, a utilitarian, and a liberal whose work explores the consequences of thoroughgoing empiricist outlook. In doing so, he sought to combine the best of 18th century enlightenment thinking with newly emerging currents of 19th century romantic and historical philosophy. His most important works include System of Logic, 1843, On Liberty, 1859, Utilitarianism, 1861, and an examination of Sir William Hamilton's philosophy, 1865. John Stuart Mill believed in the philosophy of utilitarianism. He would describe utilitarianism as the principle that holds that actions are right in the proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. Social liberty and the tyranny of the majority. John Stuart Mill articulated this principle in On Liberty, where he argued the central purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Mill believed that struggle between liberty and authority is the most conspicuous feature in the portions of history. For him, liberty in antiquity was a contest between subjects or some classes of subjects and the government. Mill defined social liberty as a protection from the tyranny of political rulers. He introduced a number of different concepts of the form of form tyranny can take, referred to as social tyranny and tyranny of the majority. Social liberty for Mill meant putting limits on the ruler's past so that he would not be able to use that power to further his own wishes and thus make decisions that would harm society. In other words, people should have the right to have a say in the government's decision. He said that social liberty was the nature and the limits of the power which can be legitimately exercised by society and the individual. It was attempted to give recognition to certain immunities called political liberties or rights and second, by the establishment of a system called constitutional checks. Now liberalism is a political and moral philosophy based on liberty, consent of the governed and equality before the law. Liberalism became a distinct movement in the age of enlightenment when it became popular among Western philosophers and economists. Liberalism sought to replace the norms of hereditary privilege, state religion, absolute monarchy and the divine right of kings and the traditional conservatism with representative democracy and rule of law. Liberals also ended mercantilist policies, royal monopolies and other barriers to trade, instead promoting free trade and free markets. Philosopher John Locke is often credited with founding liberalism as a distinct tradition based on the social contract arguing that each man has a natural right to life, liberty, and property, and governments must not violate these rights. While the British emphasized on expanding democracy, French liberalism has emphasized rejecting authoritarianism and is linked to nation building. 
John Locke. John Locke is another English uh, philosopher, 1632 four. All of you learn him under the social contractualists with Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau. Locke was an English uh, philosopher, was the first to argue that individuals had innate rights of life, liberty, and property. Government comes about through the agreement of free individuals and their rights are best protected by associating with one another. If the contract was broken, people have a right to rebel. Separation of powers. This is one of the major ideas that Locke brings in. The philosopher John Locke is often credited with founding liberalism, a distinct tradition based on the social contract arguing that each man has a natural right uh, to life, liberty, and property, and governments must not violate these rights. Liberalism started to spread rapidly, especially after the French Revolution. John Locke, nicknamed the father of liberalism, Locke's theories have formed the foundation of many important works, including the US Declaration of the Independence and constitution. His theories of social contract, the mind prop and property are perhaps the most widely known. Locke claims that legitimate government is based on the idea of separation of powers. First and foremost of these is the legislative power. Locke describes the legislative power as supreme in having ultimate authority over how the force for the commonwealth shall be employed. Natural rights. Among these fundamental natural rights, Locke said, are life, liberty, and property. Locke believed that the most basic human law of nature is the preservation of mankind. We can say here humankind. To serve that purpose, he reasoned the individuals have both a right and a duty to preserve their own lives. Locke believed that the most basic human law of nature is the preservation of humankind. To serve that purpose, he reasoned individuals have both the right and duty to preserve their own lives. The purpose of government, Locke wrote, is to secure and protect the God-given inalienable rights of the people. Locke held that individuals have a right to homestead private property from nature by working on it, but that they can do so only at least where there is enough and as good left in common for others. Thus, one's property uh, is extremely important and it is for finally his material goods. Locke finds in the natural law of reason all necessary guidance for this. The two treatises on government, that's the book he wrote. Locke developed the then radical notion that government acquires concern from the governed, which has to be constantly present for the government to remain legitimate. His influential two treatises, 1690, the foundational text of liberal ideology, outlined his major ideas. Once humans moved out of their natural state and formed societies, Locke argued as follows. Thus, that which begins and actually constitutes any political society is nothing but the consent of any number of free men capable of a majority to unite and incorporate into such a society. And this is that and that only which did or could give beginning to any lawful government in the world. The stringent insistence that lawful government did not have a supernatural basis was a sharp break with the dominant theories of governance, which advocated the divine right of kings and echoed the earlier thought of Aristotle. One political scientist described this as follows. In the liberal understanding, there are no citizens within the regime who can claim to rule by natural or supranatural right without the concern of the government. Religious toleration. Locke also originated the con concept of the separation of church and the state. Based on the social contract principle, Locke argued that the government lacked the authority in the realm of individual conscience 
as this was something rational, people could not see to the government for it or others to control. For Locke, this created a natural right in the liberty of conscience, which he argued must therefore remain protected from any government authority. He also formulated the general defense for religious toleration in his letters concerning toleration. Three arguments are central. One, earthly judges, the state in particular and human beings generally cannot depend ably evaluate the truth claims of competing religious standpoints. Two, even if they could, enforcing a single true religion would not have the desired effect because belief cannot be compelled by violence, something that many religions today are still to learn. Three, coercing religious uniformity would lead to more social disorder than allowing diversity. And after Locke, we have Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, who was very influential, 1724 to 1804. And uh, he, he's in the age of enlightenment. In his doctrine of transcendental idealism, he argued that space, time, and causation are mere sensibilities. Things in themselves exist, but their knowledge is unknowable. Theory. Kant's theory is an example of a deontological moral theory, according to these theories, the rightness or wrongness of actions does not depend on their consequences, but on whether they fulfill our duty. So it's very much like uh, the Gita's Karmanye Vadikarasya Ma Paleshu Kadachar. That is, you don't look for the consequences, but keep doing your duty. Kant believed that uh, the supreme principle, uh, he, oh, he, were, he who is also cruel to animals becomes hard in his dealings with men. We can judge the heart of a man by his treatment of animals. Happiness is not an ideal of reason, but of imagination. Science is organized knowledge, wisdom is organized life. Now his most important book for us is what is called Perpetual Peace. This is also used a lot in peace studies. Kant was an exponent of the idea of perpetual peace, could be secured through universal democracy and international cooperation. He believed that this world be the uh, eventual outcome of universal history, although it is not rationally planned. The nature of Kant's religious ideas continues to be the subject of philosophical dispute, with viewpoints ranging from the impression that he was an initial advocate of atheism, who at some point developed an ontological argument for God, to more critical treatments epitomized by Schopenhauer, who criticized the imperative form of Kantian ethics as theological morals and the mosaic uh, the law in disguise and Nietzsche who claimed that Kant had theologian blood and was merely a sophisticated apologist for the traditional Christian faith. In perpetual peace of philosophical inquiry, Kant listed several conditions that he thought necessary for ending wars and creating a lasting peace. They included a world of constitutional republics. His classical republican theory was extended in the science of right, the first part of the metaphysics of morals, 1797. Kant believed that universal history leads to the ultimate world of republican states at peace, but his theory was not pragmatic. The process was described in perpetual peace as natural rather than rational. The guarantee of perpetual peace is nothing less than the great artist's nature in her mechanical discourse. We see that her aim is to produce harmony among men against their will and indeed to their discord. Rule of law. Reichstag. Kant's political thought can be summarized as Republican government and international organization. In a more characteristically Kantian terms, it is the doctrine of the state based upon the law and of eternal peace. 
Indeed, in each of these formulations, both terms express the same idea, that of legal constitution or peace through law. Kant's political philosophy, being essentially a legal doctrine, rejects by definition the opposition between moral education and the play of passions as alternate foundations for social life. State must be based on justice and integrity. Majority rule. The state is defined as a union of men under law. The state is constituted of laws which are necessary a priori because they flow from the concept of law. A regime can be judged by other criteria not assigned or any other uh, further for those who cross pro proper to the lawful order as seen. He opposed democracy which at his time meant direct democracy believing that majority rule posed a threat to individual liberty. He stated democracy is, properly speaking, necessarily a despotism because it establishes an executive rule in which all decide for or even against one who decides who does not agree. That is, all who are not quite all. Decide this is a contradiction of the general will with itself and with freedom. As with most writers at the time, he distinguishes three forms of government, democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy, with mixed government as the most ideal for it. Utopian liberalism, the early study of IR. Please understand, as IR is a more, very much a 20th century discipline, the very first people who influenced IR was some utopian liberalism. The decisive push to set up a separate academic subject was occasioned by World War I, 1914 to 18, which brought uh, military casualties, large-scale physical destruction on the continent of continental Europe, numerous political and military upheavals, even after the main fight had ended in November 1918. It was driven by a widely felt determination never to allow human suffering on such a scale to happen again. That desire not to repeat the same catastrophic mistake required coming to grips with the problem of total warfare and mass destruction. Please understand, human beings had never seen the type of destruction that World War I, which was, you know, a total war and use of technology at that time, whatever was available at mass destruction. Devastating experience, bloody holocaust, Europe is mad, they said, and millions were killed. Finding answers for this, mis leadership misperceptions and war, secret alliances and balance of power. Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Woodrow Wilson, 1856 to 1924, was an American politician, uh, an academic who served as the 28th president of the United States of America from 1913 to 1921. After the war, he helped negotiate a peace treaty that included a plan for the League of Nations. He was a professor at Yale and he was also the president of Yale University. Why early IR is influenced by liberalism? This is a very important question that all of you students of international relations should ask. The US was eventually drawn into the war in 1970. Its military intervention decisively determined the outcome of the war. It guaranteed victory for the democratic allies, UK and France, and defeat of the autocratic central powers, Germany, Austria, and Turkey. At the time, the US president was Woodrow Wilson, who had been an university professor of international law and who saw it as his main mission to bring liberal democratic values. Only in that way he believed could another great war be prevented. Origins of the academic discipline. The establishment of the Woodrow Wilson Chair of International Politics at Abbeswick in Great Britain in 1919. The Department of International Politics, founded in 1919 with the help of a generous endowment of 20,000 pounds, 
uh, as a memorial to the students killed and wounded in the First World War by David Davis. David Davis was moved by a global vision, coached, coached in the fires of war and aimed at repairing the shattered family of nations more ambitiously to redeem the claims of men and women in a great global commonwealth, the League of Nations. The vision found concrete expression in the world's first chair in international politics, also located in Abbotsville, and named in honor of the American president Woodrow Wilson, the man whose name is synonymous with the creation of a League of Nations for the maintenance of international justice and the preservation of peace. Davis himself believed that the problem of the 20th century resolved itself in the eternal quest of justice, the conditions of which were the foundation of lasting security, a lasting prosperity, and a lasting peace, safe for democracy. President Wilson had a vision of making the world safe for democracy that had a wide appeal for, for ordinary people. It was formulated in the 14-point program delivered in an address to the Congress in 9th of January 1980. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. His ideas influenced the Paris Peace Conference, which followed the end of hostilities and tried to institute a new international order based on liberal ideas. Wilson's peace program calls for an end to secret democracies. Agreements must be open to public scrutiny. <coughs> no secret covenants. He wanted covenants openly arrived at. What are the 14 points? There must be freedom of navigation on the seas and barriers of free trade should be removed. Armament should be reduced to the lowest point, consistent with everybody's safety. Colonial and territorial pain should be settled with people to the principle of self-determination of people. Finally, a general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity of great and small nations alike. The latter's point is Wilson's call to establish a legal League of Nations, which was instituted by the Paris Peace Conference in 1990 an advocate for democracy. An advocate for democracy and world peace, Wilson is often ranked by historians as one of the nation's greatest presidents. Wilson tried to keep the United States neutral during World War I, but ultimately called on Congress to declare war on Germany in 1970. During his second term, the 19th Amendment to the United U.S. Constitution, giving women the right to vote, was passed and ratified. His promotion of democracy and self-determination. Behind this point is the liberal conviction that democratic governments do not and will not go to war against each other. Please understand this later resonates in the democratic peace theory again. It was Wilson's hope that the growth of liberal democracy in Europe would put an end to autocratic and warlike leaders and put peaceful governments in their place. Liberal democracy should therefore be encouraged. Law and, inst law and institutions, the creation of an international organization that would put relations between states on a firm institutional foundation. International relations would be regulated by a set of common rules of international law. The idea that international institutions can promote peaceful cooperation among states is a basic element of liberal thinking. So is the notion about a relationship between liberal democracy and peace. You can see the same thing coming back later, like old wine in new bottles. Wilsonian idealism. It is the conviction that through rational and intelligently designed international organization, it is possible to put an end to war and to achieve more or less permanent peace. The argument of liberal idealists make 
week is that traditional power politics, real politics, which where they criticize the realists, is a jungle. Law of the jungle, might is right, survival of the fit fittest. So to speak, where dangerous beasts roam and the strong and cunning rule, whereas under the League of Nations, the beasts are put into cages, reinforced by the restraints of international organization in a kind of zoo. What is very funny is today's liberals want to defund the police, but uh, the earlier liberals believed in the rule of law. Reminiscent of Immanuel Kant's pamphlet, Perpetual Peace. The other major thinker that we have to talk about is Normal Agnell, 1872 to 1967, was an English Nobel Peace Prize winner. He was a lecturer, journalist, author, and a member of parliament for the Labour Party. Agnell was one of the principal founders of the Union of Democratic Control. Agnell is most widely remembered for his 1909 pamphlet on Europe's illusion uh, and the great illusion, which later came out as a book. The thesis of the book was that the integration of European economies uh, had grown to such a degree that war between them would be entirely futile, making militarism obsolete. In modern times, territorial con conquest is extremely expensive and politically divisive because it severely disrupts international commerce. Modernization and interdependence involve a process of change and progress, which renders war and the use of force increasingly obsolete. Liberal view of human beings. Human beings are rational and they apply reason to international relations. They can set up organizations for the benefit of all. Public opinion is a constructive force removing secret democracy in dealings and between states and instead opening diplomacy to public scrutiny ensures that agreements will be sensible and fair. The high point of these efforts came with the Kellogg Bryant Pact of 1928, which practically all countries signed. Many people say it's one of the best pacts on paper. The pact was an international agreement to abolish war. Only in extreme cases of self-defense could war be justified. But it did not work, as all of us know. The Hague Conventions, where there are where two international peace treaties, and in The Hague in 1899 and 1907, that were attended by all major powers. It dealt with rules for warfare, but also included negotiations about disarmament and an attempt to set up a court of arbitration that would allow countries to solve disagreements in a peaceful way. A third conference was to take place in 1914. It was later rescheduled to 1915, but the outbreak of World War I put a stop to it. Why utopia? Liberal ideas dominated in the final phase of the World War I of acad and academic IR, in, in the IR, of the 1920s, these ideas did claim some success. Political and economic developments of the 1920s and 1930s, liberals, liberal democracy suffered hard blows with the growth of fascist dictatorship in Europe, which Europe had never seen this type of fascism. In Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Nazism in Germany. Authoritarianism increased in, the, in many of the new states and they were brought into existence as a result of World War I due to self-determination. Most of you know, most of the empires of Europe broke up and they were independent countries and the Paris Peace Conference was supposed to, be, to become, uh, help to become them into democracies. Wilson's ideas were shattered. Why, why are you saying utopian? Because in reality, all these good ideas would not be able to translate. Spread of democratic civilization, this idea was totally shattered. Liberal states were not only uh, not role, democratic role models. Several of them held on to vast empires with colonies kept under coercive control. Great Britain. He did not press for self-determination for non-European people. League never became the strong international organization because both the United States, most of you know the United States is a very 
its own president could not pass it to his own Senate because the eye of isolationist foreign policy of the United States and the USSR was uh, just formed after the Bolshevik revolution and it was not ready to join the League. The uh, League be became that liberals hoped would restrain powerful and aggressively disposed states. They could not stop Germany, they could not stop Italy. Germany and Russia initially failed to sign the Versailles Peace Treaty. Their relationship to the League also was always strained. Germany joined the League only in 1926 but left in 1933. We are trying to here see why the League failed. Japan also left at that time while embarking on a war in Manchuria. Russia finally joined in 1934 but was expelled in 1940 because of the war with Finland. But the time by that time the League was effectively dead. Most devastating was the refusal of the US Senate to ratify the covenant of the League. Isolationism had a long tradition in US foreign policy. The strongest state in the international system did not join the League. Agnell's crash, the Wall Street crash in October 1929-1930 marked the beginning of a severe economic crisis that would last the entire period of World War II and would involve several measures of economic protectionism. World trade shrank dramatically and industrial production in developed countries declined rapidly. In ironic con contrast to Agnell's vision, it was each country for itself. Each country trying as best it could to look after its interests, if necessary to the detriment of others the jungle rather than the zoo to go. The historical stage was being set for a less hopeful and a more pessimistic understanding of international relations. So we have put into context the other major debate that was one of the most uh, uh, criti which criticized realism that was liberalism. And liberalism is one of the first uh, ideologies to come into reality in the beginning of IR. And you know that because of the two wars, we did E. H. Carr who wrote a brilliant book on the 20 year crisis. That is between 1919 to 1939, where he critiqued this view of the, uh, what to say, utopian liberals. And then we will move ahead to the other liberals in our next lecture. Thank you. <laughs>